Hello. Hi, good evening. I'm super pleased to see such a crowded space. I hope we have enough oxygen for this lecture. Um, for sure it's not fire regulation uh, meeting the standards. So, dear students, dear colleagues, um, I would like to welcome you to this unique lecture. Good evening. Uh, we are extremely proud today to have Jean-Philippe Fassal with us. Actually, I would like to thank you for the whole day you spent with us, because from 11 on, he was joining us for the final crit of Antwerpen, of two design studios that we were teaching this semester in Paris, one dealing with leisure environments, uh, taught by guest professor Clément Blanchet and assistant Jakob Traunig, and the other one with, environment, um, with educational environments, Open Design Academy, taught by Gordon Zilbach and myself. We really enjoyed um, the precision of your comments. I think the students were thrilled to actually get the feedback of someone who knows the, the place itself, and of someone who's um, one of the most important buildings actually inspired us to do this brief. Um, because um, actually the School of Architecture in Nantes was the starting uh, point for our thinking to really challenge what is today the educational environment for architectural students. And that was the premise why we wanted to travel with the students to France uh, to really experience uh, this particular concept that we will be uh, explained in detail uh, in today's lectures as well. So a few um, words on Jean-Philippe Vassal. Um, you probably you are super familiar uh, with the studio that he's uh, running together with Anne Lacaton. So Lacaton Vassal Studio. Um, he was what it's interesting that you were born in Casablanca in Morocco and you also worked a couple of years in Africa and I think in some of the lectures that I saw um, you're also explaining how this somehow influenced to, to some of the approach you are having in architecture. Um, um, he, he kind of graduated in Bordeaux in 1980 and 85 and subsequently opened the studio very soon with Anne Lacaton. Currently he's um, a professor in UDK Berlin from 2012 on. Um, what you know, probably at least one project by them, it's, uh, it's situated in uh, in next to Architektur Architekturzentrum here in Vienna. It's the cafe, one of your early projects. Um, to me, actually, um, my first physical encounter in listening to you live was 20 years ago here in Vienna. I was a student like you in my fifth year and I traveled from Ljubljana to hear a super intense and interesting symposium on the, the question of where are we going to live in the future organized by Dietmar Steiner. So these were the challenging times where we were all sitting like you on the floor trying to listen to then young uh, and promising and very conceptual office that we admired with all these small projects, with all these kind of uh, first houses and first housings where they were radically redefining housing typologies and claiming that the pure luxury of living and dwelling, it's actually the volume, the space in itself. Uh, and for that, they were so fresh and interested for us as architects. So that was 20 years ago, and uh, let's hear uh, what is today, what is still fresh in the production of their office, why we were drawn to go and explore and experience, measure, videotape, research the project in Nantes and other projects where we can really learn so much from La Caton Vassal. So welcome Jean-Philippe to this today's lecture. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tina, and uh, Clément also for the invitation in Vienna. It's, uh, yeah, it's always a pleasure to come to Vienna. I don't come enough, probably, because it's uh, really a, a city that is really, um, really impressive for me. I really like to be there. It's always really nice to take some time here. And also, it is a memory of this work on the, on the cafe. And also, I remember it was in... Uh, 
Karls Platz. There was this project also for the uh, um, Kunstfor uh, I don't remember the, this event in uh, summer for one month um, at the uh, Kunstlerhaus. And there was a scenography there. It was really nice. Um, okay, so I, I will. Uh, I hope my lecture is not too much a mess because I make it a bit late. But it's about. I come back first to this. Uh, it was uh, one topic of the last Biennale in Venice. It was about free space, and uh, we were invited and. Uh, it was the occasion to think about what it means, free space. And uh, in fact, because we probably we, s we do the project, we work on the project, and sometimes we don't think enough about what uh, happens. And uh, so then suddenly this question of freedom, what means freedom in architecture? Um, it can be free but because it costs nothing. We think it's important. Um, it can be it can f be free because you feel the freedom. It's also about walls. We have tried most of the time to avoid to build walls and windows also because windows are the consequence of the wall. Uh, but this question of freedom was really important, and we tried to take back to some project and to see where was the free space. Well, it was for La Tapie, it was a greenhouse. Uh, for this uh, house in Dordogne, it was in the middle, the sort of uh, extra space that was in the middle, in section and in plan. Uh, here it was in Cap Ferret. Okay, the, there was no need to make free space because you just see from the window to, to, the, to, the, to the lake and it was free. What, where is the sensation of Freedom in this project in uh, in Mulhouse, the free space. It was this uh, conservatory here on top, but also this depth inside the building. Buildings of 20 meters deep. That means that in the middle you have a sort of extra space, which costs not so much because precisely it's an economic space. And uh, in Nantes uh, also there was this idea of a free space, a different space for the school, in at the different levels or in Bordeaux for this last project, it was this uh, big and long uh, winter garden that we had added to the buildings um, to, to give more space to the existing. So about the question is also to come back to, for us, to very simple things. And we come back to Africa precisely. My first house in construction, Simple things, it means to, to plant some branches in the sand in a circle, to bend them with your friends and to, uh, to, to, to make this, this form and then to start to put some straw on the outside, on the periphery, a straw that leaves the air coming through and then to finish that and to still wait for the roof and to place the roof with a different straw, a straw that will take the drops of rain out of the house. So something very simple, a sort of hut of six meter diameter with a door with a sort of fence around 1.5 meters high that protects from the wind and then nine other branches in the sand covered with a roof uh, that is a sort of, we could say, a living room. And, yeah, a house. Just made of nearly nothing in three days with the people of the village that was one kilometer far away. It's, for me, this kind of very intuitive way, this very direct way of building for is extremely important. We can say that it's also simple in, uh, in, in Mies van der Rohe, and we always look at this architecture, modern architecture of Mies van der Rohe. It can be the Farnsworth, or it can be even more, each time we have to design to think about a high rise, about uh, 
the, pro the, the project in Chicago, or you have to deal with two towers, because one tower is sometimes a bit simple, but at the moment where you deal with two towers is totally different, because it talks about the vis-a-vis. But even more, in this kind of coming back to simple things, from the Francois house of Nice, coming to this Pierre Koenig house, case study house, a social housing program in the 50s that was dealing with the minimum of material to create just space for living, for housing. It is this idea of extreme simplicity coming to an extreme simplicity that interests us a maximum. So, how many, perhaps 12 or 16 posts, very small, three meters high, 10 by 10 perhaps, and then corrugated aluminum on the roof, a facade all around, some curtains to develop the intimacy, that's all. If we can come back to the economy, if we can say, what is the cost of that? What is the cost of these posts? What is the cost of this facade? What is the cost of this roof incorrugated? It is nearly nothing. So this case study house, this social housing program is still valid, still important. So coming back to simple things, floors like grounds. Okay, Maison Domino, or in Albania. Recently, in summer, I went there and there was exactly the Maison Domino. They started to build on top and also to have a little shop on the ground floor, but they leave in, in, in intermediate floor free for later. This idea of freedom for me is really important. Or this project in uh, Berlin, in Tiergarten, Freyoto, in the IBA 87, it developed two platforms. seven meters from ground floor to, uh, to first level, and then seven meters again, a stairs leaving, uh, leading all of them. And then he asked to the people, okay, now you can come with your own architect, or by yourself you can build your house on top of this, on side this platform. It's very strange, because what we know about the work of Rayoto, it's much more about envelopes. It's much more about skins, much more about uh, in Munich, in uh, many projects. And this project, he makes exactly the contrary. He works on the infrastructure, just making very solid concrete platforms in order for people to develop their own situation. And then he works with the people, making models, experimenting, thinking, giving a sort of maximum volume that each one could have from this platform. And then they start to build. The first one, very curiously, it was on top. It's normally, you start by the, the, the ground floor, but here they start on top. And you finish the project. And today, today it's a fantastic building. People live inside Berlin, inside of Tiergarten, in a place where no one tree has been cut, in a fantastic situation. So making grounds is the first step. Then creating some climates on top. And normally, it should be enough. Playing with climates and not fighting against. So in function of the season, in function of if it is day or night, if it is warm or cold, if it is windy or rainy or sunny, you have different situation. If it is night or if it is day, you can work and play with the outside climate in in instead to fight against as most of the project happened today. So there is all the technology, very simple, low-tech technology, very economic, very cheap, that we can use and we can make projects of that. I come back to this question of inhabiting, because we can talk about housing, we can talk about villa, we can talk about collective housing, we can talk about public equipments, we can talk about libraries or school of architecture or universities. For me, it's always about inhabiting, to be fine in a place. People sometimes spend more time in their office than at home. So we should inhabit everywhere. We should inhabit in the street, 
on the plaza, under the trees, in the museums, this question of inhabiting seems for me absolutely essential. And we've always these questions of freedom, comfort, generosity, pleasure, and luxury for all. It should be economic to do that in the same way as this case study house were economic at this time for this social housing program in the US. Build double to forget the program, to forget the constraints of the economy, build the double in the same cost as 50% less. La tapis. Inhabiting beyond the functional conveys pleasure, generosity, the freedom to occupy a space. A space for living must be generous, comfortable, adaptable, flexible, luxurious, and affordable. Dwellings should offer freedoms of usage to generate possibilities for evolution, for interpretation, and for appropriation. In general, the standards of housing are too small, too restricting. The principle of standard minimum for the living space is wrong. <coughs> Offer as much extra space as programmed space to promote relationships within spaces to bring about pleasurable situations. This extra space is a non-defined space, free for use, added to the traditional spaces. Every dwelling must have a private outside space as a balcony, a terrace, a winter garden to give the possibility of living outside, of having a garden, like in a single house. It is necessary to create living spaces much more generous, as large as possible, to multiply the space for uses and appropriation. A dwelling must offer the inhabitant opportunities to move around. So it's about fluidity, mobility, this kind of possibilities instead of this one that we know very well. It means a system that instead of walls and windows create a frame with posts and floors. It's about insulation that can be instead of 30 centimeters of foam all around your apartment and triple glass to promote a sort of natural triple glass by a winter garden here and a normal facade here and just a system of posts that offer all possibilities to move around. It means building larger, twice more, building double with the same cost as a standard dwelling to be affordable for everyone building double to create other possibilities, other freedoms, new ways of inhabiting, to fully inhabit, to loosen norms, decompress space, and to allow this freedom of users, to transform and enlarge what exists instead of demolishing it, to offer twice more space to each person, necessary and essential condition to any project of increasing the density. A dwelling should have the same facility as a villa. We came back to this case study houses, case study houses everywhere, in the city, in the dense city, and in the middle of the city. Our aim is then to redevelop in the cities this concept of villa, houses with garden. The idea of luxury is therefore redefined in terms of generosity, freedom of use, and pleasure. Like in Mulhouse, social housing program, where we just create this kind of skeleton, simple, extremely simple structure, and on top of which we are placed some professional greenhouses. A sort of system dealing with producing the floors, creating the envelope for the climate, and leaving the partition and separation of the housing inside, inside that could develop large spaces, relations with outside, ventilation, 
working with the climate or with the same client another new project working with different elements another kind of structure higher in a more dense part of the same city but offering the same conditions for social housing place where people can appropriate the space invent some ways of living because we are really confident in this capacity of each inhabitant to be creative to develop its own ideas <coughs> building with it is to take account of what exists can be a beautiful space close to the lake and to think how it is possible to build without cutting the trees, without erase, erasing the sand dune, but just working with. Thinking of the light, of the reflection of the light, thinking how the trees could be kept. No one tree was cut and the sand dune was kept as it was. And then the trees were crossing the floor and the roof. Working with a tree that it is like a friend, part of the family. And just to create the conditions to sit and look outside. Working with it's not only on the beautiful spaces, it's also surrounding the cities with the people, with existing, with the climate, with the trees, the soils, with everything already there, with the economy, to do more with less. To remind the good moments, Marina Vladi, at the balcony of La Courneuve. Instead to think, 30 years later, that the only thing that we should have to do it is to demolish that. In France, these last 10 years, more than 200,000 flats have been demolished when nearly 1 million people ask for a new flat. 15 billions of euros have been de spent to demolish 200,000 flats and to rebuild 150,000. So, so much money to lose in flats. So we really believe in this idea of adding, always adding, plus. Plus it means that from that situation, you transform it to that and to that. Like that, we have worked on Tour Bois Le Prêtre in Paris. This tower it was called Alcatraz, and it was planned to be demolished. It has been totally badly refurbished in the 80s with still this question of energy system, placing some asbest panels on top and new windows that offer 20% less light than the one before. And finally, to a situation where everyone thinks that you should take it down. But what is important, it is to think about the families inside and what they could do. The old woman that lives up uh, on the 15th floor that could come back, prefer to, to come back down, or another one preferring to go to the west or to the east, or a family of 18 people that we try to find some solutions. So coming inside and trying to find all the situa situations for a transformation by addition, with the people <coughs> staying inside during the works. Or in uh, Saint-Nazaire, in this very typical situation of French suburbs, to see from one building how it was possible to consider that situation, to think that for each of these four apartments by flat, there was a so small little bathroom at the entrance, small living room, small balcony, that it could be possible to take the place of one bedroom, to take the bathroom from here to here, and then to make a storage at the place of the bathroom, and then because we lose a bedroom here to make the bedroom outside and to make a bigger winter garden plus a balcony in order to have this situation. And to do that for each of the four apartments 
by flat, by level, for new bathrooms, for new living room, but in the same time to think about densification. <coughs> or it is possible instead to have 40 families, to have 20 and 20 more families, creating new situations, a new building. So in, 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 in a way to take care of the ground, to be more efficient with the ground around, to create a situation with, with more people, it means to have more equipments, to have more possibilities. And then to build around and to create new situations. 80 families when there was only 40 families and spaces that are 50% bigger than the first one. Or in Bordeaux recently, it is the last project we work on this situation, this big wall <coughs> looking to Bordeaux, the Grand Parc, 550 families living in these three buildings that were painted in the 80s because everyone was thinking that it was enough with painting. And that also were planned to be demolished. So we should never look at the buildings like that. Should be always look at them like that. Each bedroom, each living room, each family sort of collection of richness inside these slabs that are just looking like rectangles from outside, but when you go inside, it's a fantastic richness. People living there during 30 years, day after day, each day adding something to their walls, to the decorations, new objects, new little things. The one that li likes uh, Johnny Hallyday, the one that uh, like puppets or, or tree or, or or plants, or it's fantastic interior inside. And then to think instead of demolish, just to add and to push, to create a new situation. Four meters that were added to the existing. When everything was compressed, just to give more air, more possibility, more capacity by adding <coughs> some modular elements from the outside with the people staying inside. New windows, new winter gardens, new balconies, changing the old windows, transforming the windows, old windows in new doors and new passage from inside to outside. Just to change things step by step adding the extension, fixing them to the old building with their own foundation, new posts for the next one. The old balcony, just protecting the inhabitants during the works <coughs> from pollution, taking away the, the windows, transform the windows in doors, and then reopen, make new sliding doors, new passage from the living room, from the bedrooms, from the kitchen to this additional space, creating, instead of a flat, creating a villa. And then leaving people using the space. and immediately taking advantage of the new situation. More freedom, more mobility, more possibility, more possibility to invent, to play with your cats. Giving more light, more plants, more animals. Everywhere from the ground floor the top floor and even on the roof, the possibility to add some new little case to the house on the floor, on the, on the, on the roof. To 
propose a beautiful view to Bordeaux. Just going back to the line of horizon, I think this question of line of horizon, horizontality, that I remind from the desert when I was in Africa, and this question of freedom is very important, this nomadic feeling of a situation. And coming back to this question of space for learning, space for culture, this school that I visited, that I find, by traveling in the desert, a nomadic school, when there is nothing, when it is totally flat, when there is just the horizon and nothing, nothing can be seen. You don't see any village, any people, etc. But just at one moment, you see this space covered with straw, and you enter, you just bend it a little because it's 1.6 perhaps maximum under, and then it is so hot outside, perhaps 50 or 55 degrees, and inside, I don't know, the temperature is perhaps not different, but you feel fresh. You feel a current of air. <coughs> and here you have 20 of little children looking all to the screen of the television, which is an educational program. No, no teacher, no professor. There is the TV, another TV in case of failure. And here are some batteries because on top you have some solar panels. A school in the middle of the desert with no professor, with just 20 nomadic children. For me, it is so simple, so poetic, so beautiful. And the climate was fresh under it. So it's a fantastic example for what can be a space for learning. Just because I had some, uh, some students uh, uh, we had some meetings about the question of teaching. And I always give this example because for me it's fantastic, this project of Candilis. It is the Freie Universität in Berlin. It's about also the relations, <coughs> how to build relations, a system that is a grid, horizontal and vertical passage, that is also working on two or three maximum levels, a little underground or above, creating patio, creating systems, it's a fantastic situation of relation, working on this idea of relation, how we can create relation. Because more and more, we are asked to build programs that are totally defined with the precise amount of square meter for each office, for each classroom, for each auditorium, and there is no space left. It is only functional spaces, and we think that we need to think about spaces of relations. Just to come back to the School of Architecture of Nantes, when we make the competition of the School of Architecture of Nantes, in fact, we were working on the Palais de Tokyo, and we had left the office in Bordeaux, very small office, we were four, and we went from Bordeaux to Paris. And we asked to the client if we want to work on this project that was a sort of abandoned space because of a former project. We need to have our office inside. And we need to live inside the building. It was like that before the works. And after so many projects and after two years of abandon, every project was stopped. Everything has been totally demolished or destroyed or dismantled. We found this place like that. And we asked, no, we want to work there. We want to have our office there in order, it's the only way to make the project there. It was like that. And there was a budget that was at the first phase ridiculous of 3 million euros for 10,000 square meters. Nobody knew what was done, what was rebuilt, what was destroyed or dismantled or changed. The workers and the firms that were leaving the, the, the construction site in one day, keeping all the scaffoldings inside. And for this project, we talk about freedom again. And we say what we need to make a space of freedom, a space of culture, a space for art, and I give this reference of the Plaza Gemalfna 
in Marrakesh, an open space in the middle of the city, a place where normally you have cars, bikes, motorbikes, crossing, lorries, but also some artists, some acrobats, some poets that are coming, some dancers that are coming, and immediately some circles of spectators all around. And all this together, a space of relation. Or it is possible to think about a space of relation. But also we had in mind the project of Fun Palace by Cedric Price. This liberty, this freedom. And we do the minimum that was able to do with this very small budget. But what was important, it was to leave people coming inside again and leave their creativity, leave their, of the artists, of the spectators, of the discussions, of the debates, free. And it was in this situation that we had to think about the competition for the School of Nantes. And I think it was a big change in our appreciation of the space, even if it was a, an existing space, and how the people were using the space, the artists, with some different kind of exhibitions, different kind of possibilities, Thomas Hirschhorn. All this activity, all this possibility of discussion, of debate. And the power, the power of the space to create freedom. Events everywhere, with light, without light, in the dark, in the light. And by the way, it was at this time that we really work on the competition of Nantes. A school of architecture, double space, unprogrammed space to invent users. <coughs> Build double again. So the place was fantastic because it was totally in the middle of the city in a former situation used before by the harbor with the new Justice Palace of Nouvelle, close to the river, a fantastic space. And immediately we think we should build everything. We don't have to leave any square meters free because you have so much space around, the river, the greens here, the streets, the new pl plaza here. So everything should be built. So if there is 5,000 square meters of plot, we take all of it. All of it from ground to maximum level possible. An architectural school is a place open to the city, creative and participatory for the city. The place of the knowledge about the city and the territory through the works and studies developed. A place for public debates and events about architecture, urban planning, landscape, art, society. A place for invention, a laboratory in itself of spaces and uses. The School of Architecture, it is the biggest studio of architects in a city. With all its students, with all its professors, with all the research, you have no one office that is bigger than the one of the School of Architecture. So it should be for any city for Vienna, for Paris, for Bordeaux, for Berlin. The School of Architecture is the main office to learn and to think and to be interested in what happens in architecture, urbanism, design, art inside the city. It needs to be open. This was the drawings that we made for the competition. It looks like a garage and there was a big critic about this. It, say, no, we cannot make a school of architecture like a garage. <laughs> and it was quite <laughs> a big debate <laughs> in France. And uh, we were quite alone in this position. But the question for us, it was to say, we take all the space and we offer the maximum capacity. It's more than a school of architecture. It is a platform for the city. It is a platform for the inhabitants of the city. It's a platform for all the questions that turn around this question of space, art, culture. 
And then inside this, probably there is a school of architecture with all its normal program. And then we make some images because people were thinking it was too much like a garage. And we try to show what people could do. And even on top. So then the question was also was to think about the economy. How it was possible for a program that was some things like 12,000 square meters to establish a situation where we could have 30,000 of square meters of possibility and capacities in the same budget of the 12,000 square meters. So the question of economy is really important. So it has to be simple. We have to come back to very simple things, to have some columns on a grid of 10 by 10 and to be extremely regular, extremely systematic, on even if the geometry of the plot is a bit different. And then we have to establish a system that is extremely radical, extremely clear. First, we think that the ground floor should stay as a ground floor, natural ground floor. It is asphalt. It is not uh, concrete. It is a place where you can change the ground. You can dig in the ground. It is a place where you can have a very high level of loading on top, but it is natural. It is the same ground as outside. And for us, it was very, very important, and we fight nearly six months against the engineers because they didn't want to do that. But we maintain the idea that this should be the natural floor of the city. And the first floor was there, nine meters higher, artificial floor with a capacity of one ton by square meter. And then seven meters higher, the second one, with the same capacity of one ton by square meter. And seven meters higher, the last one, that was a roof, but also a floor, with the same capacity. And that it was very important, that it looks like a sort of geography, like a relief, like a continuation of the city. Or it was possible to say there is a street starting from ground, climbing to nine, and then to 16, and then to 23 and then reaching the roof. A sort of continuation of the city, but multiplying the floors and creating more density, more capacity, more possibility. Then there was the place for the starting of the ramp, some cars for the stairs and the elevators at the different levels. The ramp still climbing, just the last one. One question was the economy of material. This is the total volume of the building and this is the quantity, the volume of the material to build it. So it's also part of the economy, to build the maximum with the minimum. It's not only the material, but the general economy. And this was the space that was normally programmed. This is the additional space to the to the program, and this is the totality. So then this simplicity should come again, the first columns, nine meters high, on this grid of 10 by 10, prefabricated, and then placing some beams to link them, prefabricate, prefabricated beams on this grid of 10 by 10, and then starting with these uh, prefab uh, floors <coughs> that gives this possibility of loading of one ton by square meter. Creating a skeleton, creating the platform, as if this building was there much before the School of Architecture. It could have been a building that was already there for storage for the harbor. Developing 30,000 square meters for a program of a School of Architecture of 12,000 square meters. And then, Inside this first building, inside this big skeleton, it was possible to add some new floors, light floors in steel and wood, or new buildings here with auditorium, with sort of mezzanine, to occupy the place with the program of the school. Like this on the level nine, like this on the level 17, and then to use it. Auditorium, and you see that the grid is still there, even if for the auditorium it was a, a deal, a challenge, 
to, to look to the <laughs> in two directions, but it was clear that it was important to keep this ID <laughs> and not to make a special system. <laughs> and you see different climates. So it is the, 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 in green, it is the programmation of all what is needed by the program. Everything is there, but the blue, it is the extra space at the different level. And then the school works, but some of you have been there with this question of open to the outside, this question of opening, sliding doors from the atelier to the street, where you can be inside, outside, open, create different project, what you want, but also dinners, but also concerts or fashion defile and to open the auditorium, to have a view to the river, or the possibility to, to make the dark. Space of life, because we can be confident in the students of, uh, and the professors also, to invent <coughs> situations, to create possibilities, to stay longer in the night, or even to marry. <laughs> to dance, to be calm, to be alone, or to make some presentations, to work normally like in a class, to make small discussions, to have views from one room to the level below and then to the city, and to gently climb, to have some professors that make a sort of alternative course, alternative class, outside, but also to have some dinners at the balcony, or to leave the students <laughs> dance. There is a lot of dance. And still keeping this way of climbing by, this, by the ramp, open to the inhabitants of Nantes. Sport. Also being an inside, outside, at the shadow or under, under the sun. To use the outside and to go up, to take the sun, to climb by bike or by running. And then to have this free situation on top. 24 meters high, to have a 360 degrees view to the city. Alone or with a lot of people or with dance again. Or to make some uh, publicity for the Clio Renault. <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's important to make some money. <laughs> <laughs> to show what you can do. Music or s skate park or banana ball, <laughs> or films. Yeah, it's, it's no more our question. It is the question of the students. It is the question of the professors. What is important, it is to give this possibility. Just to finish, it's okay, or uh, five minutes. <laughs> A more recent project, it is in Dunkerque. It was a place for art. In Dunkerque, there was a big, a big uh, harbor with a lot of activity <coughs> that fails during uh, these last uh, 15 years. And this is the only building that was still alive in this area. It was full of ateliers, hangars, etc. And this one was the last one. It was kept like a sort of souvenir, a memory of, uh, and the people there call him the cathedral because it was a huge space inside. It was 80 meters long, 30 meters high, and 25 meters large. It was a place where you can take some fragments of boats inside and work on them. And the question was, because it was abandoned, it was no more in use, the question was to make 
a center of art, contemporary art here, storage and exhibition of art. And for us, it was all the program was defined in order to make three or four levels inside to fill this void and to place, make a beautiful place for art exhibitions and art storage. And for us, it was sort of crazy idea to say that we should lose this void. So the question was how we can keep this void. And instead to, to build inside, we have decided to make a twin, a sort of double. We come back to double, double building. Because it was much more easy to build outside than inside. Because the ground was better, we had a very high level of concrete inside that was difficult to move, and outside it was better. But exactly the same browser, not the same material, but exactly the same dimension. It was a really a big hazard that the plot at 50 centimeters close was big enough to have this possibility of making it. So it was like that, and we proposed that. And all the program was inside this new browser. Just as to keep the void and to use and to create the capacity. But in the new building, we creating new visions, new relations to the outside, to the harbor, to the sea, places of exhibition, looking to the harbor of meetings, views, but also views to the former building <coughs> and look from one to the next one. Double space. Thank you, John Philippe, uh, for this intriguing um, lecture. Uh, which was dealing with so many issues, but mostly with the generosity of the void that you also kind of, uh, with, it somehow feels like um, you or Anne are a little bit claustrophobic and therefore you want to do all the places as large as possible. Is, is that a correct assumption? It's about the horizon. You know this line when you open a window and you have the chance to see the horizon. For me, it's the research of the horizon, of the line of the horizon. horizon. Perhaps I, I think the Africa was probably important because it, in the desert you see this line of the, there's just the sand and the sky. But uh, I think it's, it's, it's linked with this mob the mobility, the, nom the nomadism, possibility of movement, possibility of choosing, of changing, capacity, freedom. Uh, freedom. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was super intriguing to see Palais de Tokyo project also in terms of proportions that you found in order how you were able to build or incorporate them in the Nantes School of Architecture. I think th this kind of relationships uh, of these large, large extreme voids are super interesting. So either you found the space that you would like to keep or you try to create that one. I would like to invite you to, you have an opportunity to pose questions on anything that you heard or not heard tonight, maybe. No, you were not long, uh, long at all, actually. I think there are so many issues, oh, great, of housing, uh, the quality of dwelling, prefabrication, the generosity. I have a question about the enzyme Nantes. Um, we saw the auditorium with the yeah, column, but I was also wondering if the auditorium was placed there. Um, in a, is, there, is there some thinking about it why it was placed there in this area? Because it's the strangest geomet uh, geometry of the whole plot. Why the, is, is there the auditorium? There would be a much easier way to, to put it in a, in a different place. Thank you. 
It was a big issue to, to, to place it. Um, it was, all re it was a, an architect from Vienna that works a lot on that. He was working at the office and she, she works during, I don't know, perhaps uh, six or seven months to just on this question of auditorium. Uh, one big uh, issue was the fact that it would be, it was important to have this auditorium related with the street in order to have also possibility of renting it from outside to have this, and also to have this communication and relation with the outside. After that, uh, we, we have really tried to, to, to keep in mind this sort of game that we give us, this idea that we would build a sort of first building, which was a skeleton, and like uh, in a loft, in like if it was an existing building, we would have then to find the place for the School of Architecture. Mm -hmm. um, like if it was an existing building. It is also what we, we kept from the experience of Palais Tokyo. Mm -hmm. So even if it is a new building, you can even think that you make an installation in a, in a, in a, in a building that could have been seen before. Mm -hmm. And we like that also because we don't like when the buildings are too new, uh, like a new car. We like this idea of uh, a sort of time lapse inside the building, a sort of temporality inside the building, like if the skeleton was done f 20 years before and that the School of Architecture come here uh, later. It is also the same in the Café Una. In fact, we worked on this question of time. We plan the ceilings. And at one moment, there is a wall that is cutting the restaurant in two, like if there was com some uh, a chief coming and say, I don't mind about this ceiling. I cut, I make my kitchen here and my living. My so it's, I, I, we like to find this in the, in the project, this idea of temporality, something that are not done in the same time. As also after, we know that the users will also change. And the building is never just new or just finished. The building is a sort of something in the continuity. So about the, the auditorium, it was a bit like that. It was, I think it was at the angle. The angle was important regarding the place to the city, the, the proximity of the streets and the possible connections. And after that, it was important also because it has to be on the ground floor. It was very important for us to have the benefit of the nine meters high. So it was on the ground floor, this corner was important, and we had to, ma to, to deal with this structure inside. Which is, very, which is very evident, because it's the most unique auditorium ever with this ta um, kind of um, um, column in the middle, I guess. Um, do you have any other question, maybe? Yes, er earlier today you were talking about uh, norms and regulations. And uh, I wonder if you could, y you fight with these uh, questions on a daily basis, how, how you fight against them, or? There is many points where we, we want to fight, but if we want to fight, it because it we, have, we have the intuition that what we say is right. It's based on a sort of good sense based on a sort of experience, sometimes from very f old buildings, just to, to think about what we learned from the climatic conditions in Granada in Spain with these gardens, ventilation in the gardens, or the experience in Africa. Uh, all what is some personal experience that you can think and try to understand how it, is, how it happens or the towers in Yemen where you have this natural ventilation by the cheminées that go inside and create ventilation and humidification. So try to understand from the reality, from real experience, and then to say, okay, if, I, if it has been possible in the 16th uh, century, uh, and very precise, why we should not be able to take back to our time in a very simple way? So when we have these intuitions, we can fight. And if we are sure that we we, we, have, we could go on with this good sense. There is no reason to, to accept something that you don't want to accept. So it's a, a lot today about climatic conditions, about question of insulation, about question, and it is totally crazy to see that uh, the best eating system is the sun. Even 
in Hamburg. We are making a project now in Hamburg, really north. And if you count the quantity of energy that you take with the sun, even in a cold day of winter, it's a lot. So you, if you do with this energy and you calculate all the inertia of the building can take and the minimum that you can have to add as temperature to this natural input, you totally change the conception of the building. It's why we really think it's interesting to, to have this opening to the climate. We should play with the climate. We should not fight against. It's totally crazy for me to see all these buildings today that are more and more like jails, like prisons with uh, minimum windows. And uh, in, I don't know, in Berlin, it's only vertical uh, uh, elements like that, each 50 centimeters. And you, you, in the office, it's like if you're in a prison. So I think it's the city is beautiful. The city is beautiful, and we have to think about uh, the, the possibility of connections, possibility of filters, possibility of buffer zone, a system, very simple system where you can open a winter garden or close a winter garden, uh, open a curtain or take a, away a curtain, open a sliding door, to, to have all these sort of possibility of filters and uh, uh, between inside and outside. For me, it's really important. But it's not only the same regulation. It's why we should uh, make uh, small buildings for social housing and uh, big uh, flats for uh, rich people. Or uh, it's all these categories. We have a very poor, a little more uh, rich, uh, extremely poor, uh, very rich, medium rich, etc. Each time you have a special flat. No, OK, we should make flats for everyone, good flats for everyone, very beautiful flats for everyone. and. After that, people, they live inside when they, as they want. So it is all these regulations we want. When we had to deal with the project in Mulhouse about the social housing project, th the clients started to say, OK, but if I make some flats two times bigger than the standard flats, I will have to rent them two times more. And we say, no, there is no reason for that. The, the reason it could be you make the, the rent in function of the cost of the building. If the cost of the building is the same as the building that it is two times smaller, there is no reason that the, 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 the inhabitant would have to pay two times more. And when he agreed with that, it was fantastic. <laughs> and uh, 10 years after, he asked us to make another building like that, with the same condition. So all these things, if you have the feeling that it is normal, it's good sense to say, OK, I will rent or I will sell in function of what I have spent as money to build and not to, to, to take account of a sort of immobilian market. <laughs> because actually what we are doing it is to make flats for the immobilian market, which are not so nice most of the time. Um, I think it's pretty interesting to think that we need flats for everyone, and like you said, not for poor people or rich people. But can you maybe explain a bit more how this works, like the costs? How how can you um, assure that it that it the price won't go up if you build something new or make the flats bigger? It's uh, it's to come back to very simple relations. If I am dealing with you for your own house, for example, I can say, okay. Uh, Perhaps you want a house that it is not totally finished, or perhaps, but it is large, but, uh, uh, and we can deal with that. And it will be a much larger house at the same cost as a standard house. This, with, an, with a client for a single house, it's easy. When you have to work with developers, when you have to work even with social housing company, they have in mind the market, the normal price they could come back again to a, a very simple way of thinking. I will spend this amount of money to build my house. If it is by Zahadid, it is perhaps, I don't know, many square meters. If it is by Lacaton Vassal, it can be two times more. If it is by Clément, I don't know. It's, so it depends of uh, many things. But we, and, and uh, what I show at the beginning, it is that you have some parts of the building that are extremely expensive and some parts of the building that are extremely cheap. 
it's what is interesting. The facade, we know it's expensive. The toilets, the, all the system of bathroom, etc. it's also expensive. But when you increase the, 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 the depth of the living room of five meters, you don't add so much. And it creates a lot of possibilities more. So when you say to your client, I, w I can make a flat two times bigger at the same cost as a flat that it is two times smaller, and what should be the reason why you make the rent bigger? So you rent in function of what you pay. You, at one moment, you spend some money to build a, a project, a house, or some collective housing, and then in function of this cost, you say, then I make my benefit and I define the rents for the inhabitants. Um. All of your projects, uh, including the renovation of the housing, actually they're utilizing prefab technologies. Um, and, which is, uh, and this was also a very normal, let's say, um, principle of many buildings that we visited uh, while being in, in France. So when we see here the new housing developments, we don't see prefab um, you know, building techniques and, and, and let's say in Belgium and France, it's somehow very, very common. So in terms of price performance, I think it's really important to understand what is the building technology in certain micro location. Um, you know, how, how much does it perform and why do you think this is different, let's say in France and Belgium in relationship to here? I think it's also a bit different in, in France, perhaps not so, I see actually in Germany it's really, really difficult, or in Switzerland, to, 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 to work with prefab. Again, for me, it's to come back to some examples, to real examples. When, if I take the School of Architecture of Nantes, we didn't agree with our engineers about the structure. There was, uh, there was a very complex structure and we wanted to have a uh, very large grid, 11 by 11, in order to have less foundations because we knew the cost of the foundation close to the river was um, important. So we wanted less foundation and we want something that we could make 200 or 300 square meters by day in construction. Because we knew that if we use that, it would be, should be economic and cheap. And they say, no, you cannot do like that. And we say, we want to, to make like IKEA. Because we went to see IKEA. IKEA has this, uh, this characteristic that very often they are making some shops on several levels, when very often the, the supermarket it is only one level. So they need to work on this question of robust, solidity, efficiency, and cost. And we, we went there, they see that, and in fact, the, uh, IKEA, they work extremely cheap okay. system, very efficient, very robust, with systems that we don't never use for school of architecture or for uh, dwellings, etc. The question it is to take some examples in some other fields and to bring them to the field that is interesting for us. Because in fact, we don't mind if it will be offices, if it will be houses. It is, we come back to this idea of the Maison Domino, build floors. So any way to build floors in economic and, and uh, robust system is good, that's enough. Mm -hmm. And we work like that. And it is interesting to make this correspondence with some projects. For example, I, I am sure that the IKEA in uh, Austria, they are built like the IKEA in France mm -hmm. with prefabricated system. Mm -hmm. So this, the, this, this system of construction exists. We just should take it and bring it to the housing situation. There was another question. Thank you. Thanks for the great lecture. I would like to, if you, if you can, can you elaborate a bit more on the competition of the architectural faculty in Nantes? I think it was a very challenging design proposal also for the jury, and you got a feedback that it looks like a garage, and then you showed some additional renderings. So I was wondering, was it such a great jury, and it was a single stage competition where they recognized the great thing, and then they convinced the community about how good the proposal is, or was it a two-stage competition? So how did you manage to win a competition 
with such a challenging idea? With the garage, you mean, no? Okay. Most of the time when you look back to the project that you have built and you say, oh, it has been possible, it's a, a miracle. <laughs> it's something that you never expect. And uh, in fact, I, I think the project in Nantes, there was two, um, two steps. We were 10 and after we were five, and there was a big debate. I think we had some uh, people that really knew a bit what we were doing, so knew their our work, and that they knew that if we were saying that we can build two times more in the same budget, uh, it would be possible and understandable. And uh, they agreed then with this project. But it has been very, very difficult because there was a lot of opposition even after the choice of the jury. And the project was extremely fragile during uh, one year because there was a lot of opposition. Uh, people saying, no, you will not uh, keep the budget, etc. But for us, it's very important, this question of economy. Most of the time, you say, okay, we fix a price, and after that, the architect can make it two times or three times more. We think that the question of public interest is something important. The money, it is our money. And uh, it's, it's important to, at one moment to try to, to think with this question of economy, but in the same time, not to, be, to, be, to keep positive, to keep optimist, and precisely by working precisely on the economy, not with an economy, sometimes we work with the economy, but most of the time, most of the work of the economy, we do it by ourselves, just with what we learn from the reality in some other places. And we pick the numbers of precise numbers of the IKEA or the greenhouse, of, uh, and we see how we can take them to our project. And it's very important to, for, for, for us it's very important, this question of finally to, to work closely on this question of economy, but also as a factor of possibility, of increasing the possibility, and not as something that is a constraint. So, there is this question of, uh, in architecture, of less is more. I think today, perhaps unfortunately, but because the question of economy is important, it is also important to think about the cheap is more. Because sometimes if we can make two schools instead of one, or if we can make a bigger flat instead of a smaller one, it's important. But keep the budget very precisely, it's also very important. So the second stage of this competition was not anonymous, no? You had the opportunity to persuade someone with your experiences and uh, in your positions, which is very specific for France, I guess, in relationship to Austrian conditions. But for example, the last project, it was also a competition, the project in Dunkerque, and in fact, there was a, the, in the jury, before the jury, there is a, um, a technical committee that is looking to the project. Our project, we were five competitors, our project was out. We don't respect the program. We never built inside the building, we have built outside. So immediately the building has been placed away. And uh, it's a, what I say is a miracle. The mayor of the city, he was normally at the jury, and finally he had to move to another place and he could not be there. So one day before the jury, he comes to see the project. And the technical committee says, we have four projects. He said, I think we had five. No, one is out. He's out, it doesn't work, uh, the program. You sure, are you sure what you say? Can we take it away like that? Or Yes, yes, and then he wanted to see, and but uh, you should really check if it is possible to take it away. The check, and there was no reason to take our project away because they were so sure making the program that it was clearly inside the building that it was to make the project that they take it away. And finally, the day after, there was a jury and all the members of the jury have voted for our project. Very nice to hear these optimistic stories of <laughs> miracles in competitions. Hey, hello. Um, I wonder 
is is your way of designing and um, maybe influenced by a political uh, position transformed in the way of um, the changes in society and then how I think it, you're right it's really important to, it's uh, to to think about our time what is what is good, what is wrong, what happens. Uh, the Gilets jaunes uh, today in fr uh, actually in, in, in France, but this question of uh, consumption, ecology, what it means to, to is the ecologic uh, business or is the ecology a new way of thinking? Uh, yeah. So all these questions are very important and particularly for architecture, I think. Uh, actually, the Gilets jaunes movement in France, what it is, it means a failure of 30 years of uh, planning general planning in France that is totally uh, stupid. Well, everything coming to Paris, uh, the TGV lines and all the little cities that were totally abandoned, no more, the countryside is people are totally left and they have just built some roundabouts around the streets where finally it was a symbol of this gilet jaune. They came inside, uh, outside the villages on these little circular roundabouts to protest and to make a new revolution. <laughs> so I think it's, as architects, we are part of this system, how we deal with the space, how it is possible perhaps to, to build less or to build what is necessary or sometimes to not to build. Sometimes you, you, you feel sick and you go to the doctor and the doctor said, no, everything is okay. You don't need nothing, no medicine, etc. And you come back and you are okay. So sometimes you can do nothing and save something, solve something. It's very, all this question of adding the minimum, taking care of the existing very precisely, saving money, saving capacity, it, all of this for me is really important. It's this dealing with ecology. Sometimes people say you should build in wood or in, uh, instead of concrete, P perhaps, but I try to use the minimum of concrete as possible. And each time I, may, I try to think about the choice, if it's a wood would be better, I would employ wood, it depends on some situations. So all of this is our responsibility and it's very important, this question of uh, position of architecture, of architect. Uh, sometimes I have the feeling that we are still in the 19th century period. What it means to be architect in uh, democracy today, not only today but for the 50 years coming. I think it was really crucial to hear that we have to make a position in architecture, each and every one of us. Um, I'm also very happy to see that the younger generation of uh, French architects that we visited some of the buildings are actually taking your approach of controlling the costs very seriously and of the freedom and appropriation of the space. So I think this kind of your influencing in terms of the political agenda by controlling the Excel sheet of each of the, each of the projects, I think it, it has much wider consequences than just merely your projects, even though they are huge and uh, addressing enormous amount of, um, of dwellings, but of course also enormous amount of public spaces. So I think uh, these comments you made at the end uh, were the super valuable and I would like to leave you with the, uh, with the question, what would be your position in architecture today and how would you be fighting for the quality of architecture through those positions of democratic and very generous space that we heard the lecture about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Philippe. <laughs>